Welcome to South Orange Library's Special Conversations Program. I'm Laura Sims and I'm thrilled to be here with longtime South Orange resident Michael Gillespie, who's a translator and a scholar with a PhD in comparative literature from Indiana University. He has taught global arts and cultures as an adjunct professor at NYU, and his translations include work by the German Jewish poet Elsa Lasker Schuler that was set to music by Andre Previn. Michael has also translated this wonderful lost queer classic, now found, from the 1900s Berlin Garden of Erotic Delights. I love the look of this book. It looks like a poetry book. Oh, it's it's that size. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I really love it. It's so nice. Um, by Grenand, about whom we will learn more in just a moment. The book was banned in 2020 for its frank portrayal of gay life. Um, but here we are, over almost a century later, with the book back in print, reclaiming its rightful place in literary history. So we'll celebrate that tonight um, as Michael and I discuss the book and his work as a literary translator. So please join me in welcoming and Thank I just, you, Laura. yes, you're welcome. Um, I just wanted to start by asking you if you if you could tell us a bit more about Grenand. Well, that needs some description because no one I trust has heard of Grenand before. Uh, but when I first came across him, um, no matter who I asked, including specialists in modern German literature, they didn't know. No one knew who this person oh. was. So. Um, I felt as though maybe uh, I was onto something that uh, when I when I discovered this and how I came about discovering it is something I want to uh, get through. But um, first, I would say a few things about Grenant himself. It's not his real name. It's Eric Ritter von Busa. I'm glad we didn't have to promote a book <laughs> with that author's name. That would be challenging. We much preferred his pen name, Grenand, and obviously he did as well later. Uh, uh, added uh, Grenon to his actual name, who's a Grenon, he called himself. Uh, but it was a uh, book that was immediately banned upon publication because of its content, of gay theme content. Uh, that was in 1920. Uh, and never heard of again until, in print, until 1993 when there was a reprint of a small German press, now defunct. Uh, and that's when I saw the book, was in 1993. And there's some, dis there's some dispute, I guess, I don't know what you say, in the introduction that I, I, I addressed that, because I had to go back and think, well, because nothing had happened, essentially, in terms of publication for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. By the time I did get it published, uh, I had to remember, like, well, how did I come across this? Where was I? Where did I find this book? And I, I thought at first it was, uh, I looked through some documentation that I had, which is especially not very full, surprisingly, because I document things uh, from that particular period. Uh, and uh, I had taken a trip to Berlin that year and visited uh, the uh, Queer Museum, or Schurlis Museum, as it's known. And I was pretty sure I, that's where I had come across the book. But uh, then Marvin tells a story about our having gone to a uh, bookstore in New York, a different light, now it no longer mm -hmm. exists, but they had, we went to the one on Hudson Avenue, they, had, they were on Hudson Street rather, they were on Hudson and I think somewhere in Chelsea. And that he has a distinct uh, recollection of my finding this book sort of scattered among several other unrelated books in this store and starting and picking it up and starting to read it and becoming hooked on it. And uh, he asked me in his account, uh, what are you reading? And I said, well, I think this is a book I need to buy. So um, I, over time, have come to Marvin's memory uh, of the event. I, I think it, it stands up to scrutiny, I think, and, uh, and I'll accept it now. But at the time I was writing the introduction, I was genuinely uncertain. Um, 
his years, 1885 to 1939. Right? We don't know that much about him. He was born in a town called Magdeburg to a Prussian military family. Uh, he uh, went to a military school just outside of Berlin, uh, which is like one of the characters in one of the stories. There, there, but little we do know about Renan uh, we, uh, is reflected, many things are reflected in the stories. There's a certain autobiographical element that works its way through. But he, um, he got a, a doctorate, doctorate in art history from Basel. He first studied law. That was probably uh, a rather uh, risky thing for him to have done at the time, to give up the law, especially given the background that he had, and the background of the family and the military, and, and to pursue instead a degree in art history. And he worked as a director and dramaturge in, uh, in Berlin, and then later in Munich in Berlin, uh, it was uh, under uh, uh, Max Reinhardt, who was probably the most famous uh, dramaturge in that period uh, in Berlin. Uh, and um, there was, there's now, by the way, a uh, entry in the English Wikipedia. Uh, with, had there had been nothing for him before. Uh, which is actually very accurate and a, a little bit more up to date than what we uh, have in the book. Um, the person who, who created the entry did an especially good job. I don't happen to know him, <laughs> but uh, I thought that, that, so that actually, so with the book, with the Wikipedia entry, <laughs> this guy is maybe starting to um, get some press. <laughs> but our focus is on that 1920 date when uh, his, his book was uh, uh, sort of um, censored. Uh, and one of the things this demonstrates that censorship frequently works, that you can, you can ban a book, you can censor it, and, uh, and it's forgotten. This is, a, this is a story, among other things, of a book that was a, first forbidden and then forgotten. Uh, so it was about 70 years after the 1920 banning that it, the, the reprint occurred, and now nearly 100 years with this translation that, um, that had been since, uh, since he published the book. The language that was used in the German criminal code was that the work was to be made unbrauchbar, which means something like not useful or, or useless. If you can imagine your job being to make something useless, you know, so that no one can use it. If there's something, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a simple word that carries a kind of chilling resonance. Uh, but so, um, so it was. I discovered it, and then of course uh, serendipitously. Another interesting note to that is that. And I point this out in the introduction as well. Uh, censorship itself was actually banned in the German Constitution of 1919. And here we see nearly a year later uh, that it's being banned. Uh, so it, it, so in, among other things, it exemplifies the struggle within the Weimar period between you know, uh, this ushering in a new era of experiment, of experimentation and freedom and so on, uh, while uh, still unable to overcome certain uh, aspects of its past. Uh, and, you know, when I was first uh, writing this as well, uh, people would sometimes pick up on that and say, well, how is it that, you know, it could you know, if they if they banned censorship in 1990, that it could one short year later be banned. Well, that that a that a fundamental or what is considered a fundamental right uh, is enshrined in your constitution in one day and gone the next is something we now experience, and we know sure a little bit more about how that can happen. Uh, so, what I wanted to focus on. Uh, Knowing a little bit more about Grenon then, and is, and the banning of his book, I uh, thought what, we, what might be interesting to look at is uh, 
aspects of the book that's, that are prominent and that, that make it an interesting story that people have missed because it was banned and not available because it had been made useless. And the two things are, I think, is that the insider view that he offers of, of this particular period, this particular noteworthy and exciting period. Uh, and secondly, it's positive representations of, of gay life at this time. Um, it, 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 it fundamentally changes the narrative about that simply by having this book available. Because there are certain, certain conclusions one would have drawn uh, about what life was like uh, for gay people at that time. Um, you know, that, that narrative shifts now with the, with the appearance of this book. If people, if English language readers know anything uh, about the period, it's through uh, work by Christopher Isherwood, who, uh, whose work then was redone and ultimately became Cabaret, right? But uh, what's missing is the kind of uh, nuanced, humorous, insider account of the clubs of Weimar Berlin, and it's, uh, it's uh, detailed and elaborate descriptions uh, of them. Uh, in one of the stories, uh, the main character is uh, uh, seeking uh, a love interest of his who had stolen his coat, and he, so he's going, and he ends up going to two different clubs in, or, in, in his pursuit uh, of this. And in the process, uh, Grenand is able to give us some a, a, a very detailed and interesting account of what that was like and, and, and what purpose it served uh, for them. So uh, one of the passages I wanted to read is his description of entering one of the ballrooms that he visits. One of the, the, one of them is more of a ballroom, the other is I would describe as more of a club. Um, So in, on Saturday evening, Eric shows up around 11 p.m. at the Diana Ballroom. The Diana is completely different from the Paradise Ballroom. First of all, it boasts a beautiful room with high ceilings and ornate architecture and the Empire style, a hall whose for formal nobility puts anything on the west side of Berlin to shame. Here, you could imagine your great-grandmothers taking their first virginal dance steps at the Choral Society Balls. Then a real string orchestra plays on a brightly colored stage that has been built into the hall with a studied nonchalance. And finally, the guests are decidedly upscale. It costs five marks to get in. Soldiers and working class guys are distinctly in the minority, while choice attire, pleated trousers, and cologne prevail. And the previous uh, club that he's in is very much more working class than this one. So we get this attention to social class in, in the work, and in, in, uh, in the detailed descriptions that he offers. The better area of the city, including the Talensing Boulevard, is well represented, as well as that world that thrives on gossip. So uh, it's sort of a page six of Weimar Berlin, you know, page six New York Post. So um, that's, that description, I think, is we get here, we don't get anywhere else. I don't know of any other work of this period that offers this kind of account uh, of, his, of the experience in a club. So um, in the... Uh, the other, there's a short passage from the Paradise Ballroom, uh, just a bit before this too, that I think conveys effectively, you know, what this experience means for these for its participants, for the people who who hang out uh, at this club, and the kind of freedom that it that it offers them. Um, we read. Meanwhile, the atmosphere in the hall has an intensified. Poetry also lives in beer. And we find, we find the, the dancing and everything that goes on in this club quite different from the one we just, we, we just saw. It's much more sort of ecstatic. Poetry also lives in beer. It doesn't always have to be wine. 
a few glasses are enough to lend a certain aura to life. It's also sort of a class remark on his face, too, about the beer and the wine. With a bit of alcohol in your veins, you see the everyday through multicolored glass. His use, by the way, there also of multicolored struck me as uh, interesting because he, again and again, he refrains from using sort of the obvious word, which in this case uh, might be sort of like rose tinted. Uh, but he, it, more, the more literal uh, rendering of that is sort of multicolored. You see the everyday through multicolored glass. In short, a Dionysian delight and heedlessness rules. People kiss in the corners and sit on one another's laps. Some, forgetful of the world, their lives, and everything else that exists, sit close together, silently holding hands, gazing into their partner's eyes. They get up like sleepwalkers, only when a new song begins, and then they dance some more, retaining their intimate embrace. Here, there are no lies. Here is simple humanity, all poor sinners, if you like, doing what they cannot help and being who they are. Again, you know, sort of, you don't get a view that you don't get in, in, in anything else. So, um, uh, I would go on to my second point, unless in the meantime I don't want to shut you up. <laughs> if, you want, uh, uh, if you have a question that relates or would say, because my other point was like the, the very positive representations, yeah. and there are some passages that I think convey that as well. Mm -hmm. That's what struck me when I was reading some of your blurbs uh -huh. for the book. Um, you have one reviewer, Professor Hancock, mm -hmm. who says, that the book shows that gay life was not always subjugated, but that gay men in the 1920s enjoyed life and flourished. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, exactly what you were saying. It's, it's mm -hmm. such a, uh, it's not what you would expect right. from gay literature of the 1920s in a book that was banned mm -hmm. to have this like joyfulness and, right. you know, right. celebration. Right, right. And uh, and and therefore, you know, that aspect of things was was, was missing. Uh, you know, the, of the five stories, there is one that was reprinted in a magazine, and it's it is it's it, interesting to me is that it was the most um, stereotypical story that they reprinted. How was it? How was it stereotypical? How was it? How was it stereotypical? Uh, well, it, it was uh, it's the story called Apparition in my translation, and it's about uh, someone who is uh, frustrated by his sexuality yeah. and doesn't um, sort of a uh, a Thomas Mann kind of figure. Mm -hmm. Mann is not exactly known for uplifting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, portrayals of his gay characters, uh, and and in fact there are there are obvious uh, references in the work to the main character in uh, Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, uh, Aschenbach is his name, um, and um, so uh, yeah. So that was the one that was published during his lifetime. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's what the editor of the gay magazine thought worth reprinting, mm -hmm. as opposed to any of the others. Mm -hmm. it's, a very, it's just a very interesting mm -hmm. uh, photo that if you think. Um, so he, I think, I think also to go back to what you were talking about, Joe's uh, uh, remark, is that the other thing that results from you know, that the book was, uh, was banned are any uh, sort of um, you know, positive images and so on that could be taken up uh, by the LGBTQ community. Um, and um, uh, made, made usable right. you know, rather than unusable it or, seems. Or, un, un, or useless. So uh, there's one of the ways in which 
the positive representation is played out, I think, in the, in the work is that in each case, I mean, there's, each of the stories revolves around a very specific erotic encounter. And the, and the character, in some places, the character has become transformed uh, as a result of this. And that's and the, other, the other aspects of the work that I think uh, reflect the positive representations is just his, his humor. His, uh, his ironic, his sense of irony, the playful kind of irony that he has. Um, but the moment of transformation from the, it going, it goes, this goes back to the story that, that includes the scenes in the ballroom and the club. Uh, and the, the two uh, protagonists are Eric and Trudy. And finally, after this long chase, uh, it's the longest uh, story in the collection, uh, they finally uh, embrace. And we read on page 23. Um, okay. uh, his love interest is a person named Eric who's uh, dressed as a sailor um, and who uh, has, has a tattoo prominently uh, figured on his chest. He looks at Eric with his large sailor's eyes, and the rays of the rising sun tattooed on his chest shine invitingly and seductively, while from the dance hall can be heard the muted sounds of a devilishly sensuous waltz. At that moment, it's as if the entrance hall and all the people standing around disappear, and as if everything earthly dissolves into a gray mist, and these two beloved children, defying all the principles of a proper upbringing, enclosed in a deep embrace and a long passionate kiss, sending them heavenward. Finally, as if in a dream, they stagger into the hall and join in the waltz. So, um, and, and in, as I said, in each case, but in very different ways in, in each case, you have this sort of moment of transfer, transfer, sort of self-transformation as a result of this uh, encounter that each, each one has. Uh, in the case of the apparition, the story that had been reprinted, it was, it was the, the, fa the, the failure of this transformation that becomes its focus. But um, in, in other respects, it plays out in much the same way. Yeah, in this one that you just read, there's a real like innocence and lightness to mm. the feel of that right. scene and the, the voice, I right. feel like. Right. It's not uh, heavy. It's not a heavy, like right. a dark, you know. Right. Well, you mentioned his voice. Mm -hmm. that it, so, uh, and I, I think that's, I think of translation, it raises certain issues of translation, it generally takes place in stages. I, that's what I like to think of them in way, where, um, uh, you know, you, you try, you, in which you go from, merely translating words to capturing a voice. And it's in capturing the, the, the voice that you have sort of the artistic intent of, uh, in, of translation. How do you make it work uh, uh, in English? Um, so I think that, um, uh, and I think that this author has an especially apt voice suitable for his material. Uh, and, and it enables him to, uh, you know, make, to represent uh, these characters that he portrays in, in ways that we don't see in anything else, as mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mentioned before. I feel like this book would be you know, relevant to the LGBT community today. Have you had, what have been responses that you've gotten? I haven't gotten much, as much in response as I would like. <laughs> uh, and and uh, not, not a great deal of feedback, tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure what to make of that. Mm. It is a small press, but yeah. what were you gonna say? I think it's pretty, uh, the atten well, this, the tendency is to not 
as you say. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. But, Take your time. Uh, you, did, you received about 30 or 40 people at the, um, the, the center. Okay. All right, all right, that, all right. But you can't <laughs> accept that. Also, I, I Marvin's mean, version is the one, <laughs> right? Yes, right. That's all. <laughs> uh, and if, I don't know if you're familiar with the Gay and Lesbian Review worldwide, but they did review it. It's okay. a very good Great. review. Great. That, that's sort of the one place in terms of gay publications you would want this work to appear. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was uh, positively reviewed there. So, okay. Good. I'm good. <laughs> Once again. Uh, so great. And so, did did you have when you first read the book in mm -hmm. that bookstore? I forget. Was it uh, in German or w it was translated? It was in. German. It was. It was in German. Okay, this was yeah. the first translation. Yeah, because this um, is the first translation. Right. And so, could you? Did you connect with? His voice immediately. Yes, is that part of it. Yes, I think. I think, and and I was surprised over the next thirty years that no one else <laughs> responded in quite the same way. Um, you know, it's sort of a self-generating, fulfilling prophecy. I think. You know, I mean, somebody's book is banned. No one knows about it. it that's a big. That's a big hurdle to get somebody to pay attention to a work that nobody knows about and it hasn't been it hasn't achieved as any kind of endorsement. Right. Uh, and so you have to you have to use your own judgment, I, I think, about you know, uh, about the work. And that's hard for people to do. Yeah. And in, in terms of publishers it's hard for them to make money. Right. Uh, because that was the that was the if not the uh, overt uh, underlying uh, reason I think in many cases is that it wasn't commercially viable. Right. Uh, wasn't going to make them money. So uh, I, I just think that that's a hard leap for people to make. Mm -hmm. Right. This is my conclusion. From it. It's not as if I was trying continuously over 30 years uh, to get this published either. Uh, it, it was something that was just sort of always there and that every once in a while, not on any particular timetable, would draw me back to it. Uh, and never quite gave up on it. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, and you finished it in 2020, is that right? Yes. In 2020, and there was a lot going on yes. in your life and yes. the world yes. around then. So how did you, I don't know, was it kind of a place of refuge for you to yeah. turn to the book and work your work on it? Yeah, I think that's actually a good way to put it. Uh, that it was, uh, it was something you could always go back to and immerse yourself in, right. and um, and make progress on. Right, and, and a lively like scene too. It feels like it would be a fun place to escape to the world of this book. Right, right, right. I, I think, At that time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's definitely the case. Um, and you you. Once you've sort of done it and published it, you miss that. Right. <laughs> yeah. You have to. You have to find something else. <laughs> right. Right. To, to carry on. Yeah. And are you working on something? Well, you know, uh, no, I'm not. And um, I would be open to another discovery. Okay. <laughs> but um, but I haven't I haven't achieved that yet. Okay. What? I haven't found that yet. Yeah. And what are some of your other translations that you've that you've done? Well, you know, I, I have a, sort of a long-standing interest in translation. Going back to my graduate school days, I did a. Uh, it was a, it was also a period in which, in academic circles, translation was not really paid much attention to. Um, 
and so uh, I, I, I mean, I did a master's thesis that was a translation and an introduction, and I did a uh, dissertation on translation theory. There's very little in translation theory, literary translation theory, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to some poetry by Elsa Wasserschiller, the, one of which became set to music by Andre Previn. So uh, I like poetry in, in particular. I, but it, you asked, you had mentioned uh, earlier in a conversation with us about the preference for translating prose or poetry. Right. But, you know, this is where I think someone like Renan sort of falls in between there because he's, he's it's a, I find it a very poetic text. Right. And uh, that's, that's, that's a feature of his voice, I think, that was, you know, you we needed to preserve. Um, and all his asides, a lot of his techniques, I think, reflect, you know, we talked earlier about his, his sort of autobiographical sort of thread that works his way through here. Uh, his work as a theater director, uh, all the, the each, each of the stories begins almost like a set of sage directions. Uh, and he has these asides that he gives in which the narrator uh, suddenly comments on what is happening in the story and so on. Um, uh, again, I think reflecting his interest in the theater and his background in the theater. So um, one of the other sort of interesting things that for me about this is uh, having spent so much time with him, you feel ultimately as though you have some sort of understanding of this guy, even someone to you about whom we know very little. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that is with, comes from, I think, this autobiographical element that he has. Um, so. Absolutely. I feel like he would be really popular if he were writing today. You know, that right? <laughs> Why do you think that? Well, with the, what you were saying about the way each story opens with stage directions, you know, mm. he's like drawing on his, he sounds kind of almost like a screenwriter mm. with, and the world that he's creating, I don't know. Right. I can see it. Right. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's hard to pin down. He, he, he sort of has an interest in a lot of different areas. Yeah. You know, uh, when he moved, when he emigrated to Brazil, he took up painting, and which is not something he had done because he had written about on a sort of an art historical level about painting, but he had never huh. sat down and painted. He himself had not sat down and painted, and he did that at that time. So, Have um, you seen his paintings? Are they, they are his paintings in existence somewhere? Yeah, I don't know for sure. Okay. I don't know for sure. And he was exiled to Brazil? Is well, that where he... you know what? Holby knows that he left in this rather important year, 1939. Oh, okay, right. Oh, well, actually, he left and a few years before that. I should say they died. He in died in 1939. Okay. But he left just a few years uh, before that. So, not a pretty period. It was no. the early 30s. Right. But the, by the time he left, the, these clubs did not exist. Right. They were shut down. Yeah. So, uh, without any sort of explicit evidence, you know, about what motivated him, it's, a, it's clearly moving at a time when things were getting a little rough. Yes. Um, and, um, and, yeah, that's as much as we know. It's kind of interesting to me, though, that there are these gaps, which, which, which once you spend time with him, read him carefully, or is in my case uh, translated him, which is sort of a, a way of, uh, in and of itself, a, a kind of close reading of his works, um, you know, that he uh, that you get to you, that you get to know, you think you know more about this person than than anything else, than maybe than anyone else, and, right. uh, and, you, and you, uh, you, you can sort of imagine his interests, and, um, and you know, he did a lot of different things that don't pull together very, very predictably, mm -hmm. but um, there's, there's a lot there to, to examine, I think.
mm -hmm. in, in the little that's available. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the challenges of translating the book? Well, one thing is I had too much time because I would go back to it, you know, over oh. the course of 30 years, right? And, uh, and at some point you think, well, what is preventing this person, what is preventing this work from getting published? Is it something in the translation <laughs> that you begin sort of questioning the thing? And ultimately, and so there were, there were certain features of his work, such as the asides, which could be seen as a little mm. goofy, right? Uh, that you might be tempted to um, to do something with. And, and and but I but I think one thing I learned from spending so much time with his work is that that's not really the right thing to do. Uh, this this has to. He did this for certain reasons. This is this is it's uh, it's a feature. Of, it, of his style, uh, and um, in, in making that clear that that's part of his style is an important task of the translator, mm -hmm. I think. Right. Um, and uh, and you know, the, the more I, I read him, the more I appreciated his style. Right. Um, I at one, at one point when I was working on this, I can't remember. It's, it's a movie from the late '60s, Michael Caine, Elfie. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Same thing is going on in that film. He's constantly turning to the camera and, and, and talking and making comments and so on. So this is exactly what he does uh, 40 years earlier. Uh, and part of that maybe goes back to your point, too, about um, you know, uh, that he might be appreciated now for, might be. for reasons that he wasn't at the time. Yes, he was ahead of his time. Yeah. I was thinking of Fleabag, do you know that television show? It was very, very popular, mm -hmm. five, has it been five years? I don't know, uh, anyway, she does that, she turns to the camera uh, and talks, uh, uh, and yeah, it's really. Yeah. And, so. uh, and you have the whole tradition in German literature too, Bertolt Brecht and the fourth, but in the, uh, with, uh, the alienation effect as it's translated. Uh, which you break through that fourth wall, right. so that it also connects it to his interest in the theater. So right. he, do, he doesn't, as far as I can tell, you know, uh, refer explicitly to someone like Breck, but um, nonetheless, he's operating in that environment. Right. And so I kind of know the answer to this because I am friends with several translators, but do you feel that translators are given enough recognition for the work that they do? Well, that's a that's a that's a common refrain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, among translators, and, and, and especially in in uh, in this country, which mm. pays them very little. Mm. I would I wouldn't be particularly interested in translating something for the pay. Right. Uh, I mean, it's more the compassion and, and, yeah. and, and more the, the passion and then the pay. Right. It's something that's good. I, and if I were to go on to another project, it would be something that would have to genuinely interest me right. and be worth my time because it, does, it, doesn't work, it doesn't work for any other reason. I know several translators who are uh, uh, very, very good translators who won't translate anymore because it doesn't work it. Mm. Other cultures value it quite highly. German culture, mm -hmm. actually, uh, very different view mm -hmm. on translations. Mm -hmm. So part of it also is cultural. Cultural. You know, uh, and uh, and the fact that um, it's it's not it's not valued by our culture. Right. I mean, I see here that they've put you on the cover. Yes. Which I think they should always do with okay. the translator, but. Does right. not always happen, or right. even usually happen. Right, that's true. It might right. be inside, you know, right. inside, but not on the cover. And uh, yeah, and my uh, dissertation advisor actually is the translator of uh, the Tin Drum by uh, Günter Grass. He he came. He did a new translation of Grass, published I think about ten years ago or so. 
and he has an afterword, a translator's afterword. And at, interestingly, it's not an introduction to the work. It's a, it's a, even in his case, I mean, he's an extremely well-known translator, and he um, took on this enormous task of translating, you know, if you can imagine, you know, the, the tin drum. And yet, and has lots to say uh, about, about translation. They, they stick it in the back of the book, um, huh. as opposed to some, instead of the front of the book. Right, right. Where it might more, more people be, might yeah, right. yeah. start with that. Bring more attention to itself. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Does anyone else want to jump in with a question? So, I have a question. <clears throat> when you're translating, is it a conscious decision to not contemporize the translation to keep it? authentic or is that something that is like in the translating translation circle mm. is that something that's considered gauche to contemporize it and bring it up to contemporary speech and mm. and mannerisms and like <clears throat> the asides that you mentioned sound very similar to a lot of american television shows or based on british television shows like um the office has the, the sides where they look directly to the camera they break the fourth wall um, and Modern Family, and now Abbott Elementary, they're, they're utilizing that as a technique uh -huh. to, to draw the, the audience in. Mm -hmm. And when you said that you kept it in, as a reader, I so appreciate that, because I don't want it to be contemporized. I would want to see how he wrote it. Right. But I'm just wondering right. how that works in the, in the, I the think, circle. I think it might more likely be made contemporary if there are like multiple versions. You know? where uh, people might feel a little freer to experiment, uh, as opposed to a situation like this where this is the first English translation. I think that you would want to avoid that and have, uh, you would go along with what you were saying about what you appreciate the fact that uh, it's not, you don't want it contemporary. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, th I think as I said, in those instances where there might be multiple translations, you're more likely to find this. People trying to find new ways into the work, uh, knowing that maybe other more literal versions may already exist, so you don't have to worry about that. But um, So I think it comes into play maybe in instances like that. Mm -hmm. Someone else is responding to a previous translation right. by trying to make it new and different. You, you see that a lot, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially you know there are like key lines or phrases from classic works that uh, you know, uh, "Arms in the Man I Sing," beginning of Virgil's Aeneid. Okay? You, people want to do something different with that, you know, because yeah, we've heard that already. Right. And so you, when you, if you, if you compare the translations of opening lines of Virgil's Aeneid, you'll see a broad array of, yeah. and and you, and you, and what you witness also is people sort of competing with each other for that. Right. And um, um, yeah, so I, I was trying to think of what some of the others are. Uh, Arms in a man, I think, is a more literal translation of the Latin, but. Um, but there are, it's not, they're coming to me what some of the other options are that, have, that, that, right. that it's been given, but it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, that's, you do find that frequently. Mm -hmm. But this is the first, so right. it'll be the, the standard against which people will <laughs> yeah. rebel or. <laughs> right. So, um, did you want to read a, like a passage that another passage that you had? Was there like a, uh, let me see. You've read a couple short ones, but if you wanted to right, read, right, right, that would be nice. Sure, if I had any other one marked. Can we, can we, can we, can we uh, be spontaneous here? If I yeah. 
I just opened two. An interesting, uh, it's not very long, yeah. but it's um, his own prologue. He, he has a sh very short prologue to, uh, to the book to, that covers sort of all five stories, mm -hmm. and which I find interesting in terms of the positive representation that we've talked about earlier. And uh, he titles it The Little Garden. The, the, the translation of the original work is something more like um, the, the Little Garden of Erotic Comedy. Literally, that's how it comes out, which I changed to Berlin Garden of Erotic Delight. The Little Garden of Erotic, of, of erotic Comedy. So the, the word in his original, the word comedy itself is there, so he's highlighting that it's oh. a, obviously as, as one of uh, a feature of his approach. It's called his prologue, The Little Garden. This little garden is no artfully constructed, well-maintained, stylized park. It has crooked, convoluted, and uncontrolled paths, flowers in the dazzling colors of a farmer's garden or with riotously fragrant aromas. It has thorns and plenty of weeds, but over it all, the great hot sun shines, the melancholy moon passes by, and the innocent stars twinkle. This garden is a slice of life. Mm -hmm. I don't know. ask you, what do you think that tells us about what he wants to accomplish in his, uh, mm -hmm. In school. <laughs> <laughs> no, it it feels like the slice of life seems oh. very crucial to this, okay. right? So, yeah, Just from what I've gathered, yeah. is that the focus on these in the moment stories. Right. It's not a book that's trying to, you know cast a wide net and make a big statement, mm -hmm. right, right, about this right. world that we're seeing. But we're just being given a view into mm -hmm. this world and these people's lives. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah I'd like your, your focus also on the slice of life. I mean, this is like something that otherwise he seems to suggest it would not be addressed right. or, 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 or omitted. Seems also to call up this you know, distinction between you know, uh, English versus French parks. Oh. You know, English, right. English you know, parks. English, are especially in the German uh, 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 view, was seen as more wild mm. you know, and overflowing and, and uh, alive say, than the orderly sort of French uh, landscape yeah. uh, that was sort of traditional. But also, it's a it's it's this very queer place that he describes. Right, it's, it's, it's like, crooked paths. Like, yeah, the, the, the things going in all kinds of directions, <laughs> and uh, uh, he and he and he. I think also he was uh, constructing this also with the. Uh, with the uh, censors in mind and trying to get around them without saying anything explicitly. Right. Uh, opening. We, we lost that. I, mean, I find it interesting that some bureaucrat first in Berlin and then in Leipzig actually sat down and, and read, read it. Off. I know. Right. That's how it got censored. Throw this away! So, <laughs> he um, may have enjoyed it too much. <laughs> so, uh, I like that he says, um, it has thorns and plenty of weeds. I don't know, there's like an embracing of, yeah, the wildness and the, it's not a pretty picture, but it, it's also still very mm. positive in that way. It's mm. embracing mm. those weeds. Yeah, right. I think that's a good point. And I like too that it's over it all the great hot sun shines. So the sun is the this dominant image, and the moon, pa the melancholy moon passes by. So there's some melancholy, but it's mm, like passing, right, right. and the innocent stars twinkle. Oh. It's very. It's well, his attempt is not to, to uh, is not to suggest. I think that this is a perfect world, right, right, right. Uh, but that um, uh, you 
code. It's a, it's a, it's a world that needs to be understood mm. and captured and represented. Right. Uh, it goes back maybe to the point you made on the Joe Hancock work, uh, that it, what it offers is certain images and mm -hmm. narratives uh, that, um, that people can relate to in some mm -hmm. way. And if it's if banned, you can't do that. Right. It's no. not available to you. No. Um, but now it is. <laughs> what about the cover? I love the cover. Yeah. I don't know if you can see. It's a picture, a photograph from 1931 by Brassai. Yeah. This um, is called Homosexual Ball at Magic City. This was a place. In, up in Paris, and um, it took place in the spring, I think probably connected to Mardi Gras. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, 31, that would have been close to a time when they would shut, have to shut down as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the cover's wonderful. But, um, I like the uh, I like the uh, cover. Yes. Did you? Uh, I love the cover because it's got all the types. Mm. <laughs> it's yes, got it does. A man, a woman, man, a man, right. a, a, a poetic queen. Mm -hmm. They're all there on the bright cover. That's cool. Did you have say on the cover design? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you choose the photograph? Uh, no, it's a archival photograph. Okay. okay. Our editor came up with it. She had first had uh, worked with the image so that the two characters on the left were the only ones in the picture. Oh, okay. Uh, and as it turned out, she wasn't allowed to alter the, uh, the image. And okay. I think that ultimately that was a good I idea. I think that's for the best, yeah. Because it did, as you mentioned, Marvin, it just shows a variety of yeah. types. It doesn't focus on just, you know, one story, one type. But it, 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 it sort of reflects the, uh, the intent behind it, mm. the prologue. Right. Yeah, it captures the scene instead of just... the one laying back with the feather. I know. Is that a feather? <laughs> I can't <even. laughs> yeah, that's and people, wonderful. you know, you, you've got s some who would be more comfortable at the Paradise Ballroom and others who, in this very picture, would be more comfortable at the Diana. That's right. <laughs> the Diana was with the they're beer. Clearly, they're clearly wearing pleated trousers. So you, know, you can't see them. <laughs> well, were there, and, the, and these are for sale for $10, just mm -hmm. so you know. Um, any last questions for Michael? Yeah. When you were translating it, did you have to do put in footnotes to explain different cultural things from Japan? Oh, did you have to put in footnotes to explain different cultural changes from Japan? There's, there's one note. German. There's only one note, and that's in uh, uh, Apparition, which is the final story. Um, it, it needed a gloss, and so uh, it, it, there's a there's a note at the bottom. That's the only uh, that's the only example in the book of that. What uh, is it? I would I'd be, I'd be, I have no problem with notes as a technique, you know, uh, but I didn't feel as though beyond that one instance it needed any. What was the the note? Yeah, uh, let me see. Oh, I see it. There's a. Um, I need my reading glasses to find it. I found the footnote, but I don't see where the. Uh, it's on page uh, seventy. Yeah. There's this. Uh, on his arm hangs a young Apache. It's the word. It's the word Apache. Oh, and, okay. And, and what that means, and that's that's uh, that's detailed. Uh, 
there. Okay. Uh, young men. In the know. It was used to refer to young men from poor backgrounds in street gangs known for violence, a disregard for authority, and their flashy style. Right. And obviously, that we would, you know, that's an insulting term now. So. Right. There's a certain American Indian influence there too mm -hmm. in their yeah. sort of in their late nineteenth century view. Right. Um, so uh, I felt that clearly needed some help. <laughs> that was smart. And uh, you know, there's an instance of the there's something that's part of the translation, it's not in the original, obviously. Um, it could have been, I suppose. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is our last special conversation until September. Um, there is this upcoming program I just want to um, promote here called Two Queers and a Book Discussion on June 15th, 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, join librarians Jenna and Erica to talk about your favorite LGBTQ books. And I don't know if the books are chosen or if you bring them, but can always call us to find out. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you.